have been um, measuring three parameters on the indoor climate in this room for the past two days. Um, let's have a look. Oh. Here you go. This is online. And what we have here is the amount of the level of CO2 in the room here. As you can see, I started the sensor around 6 o'clock in the morning. So the first samples are from my room. Um, and there's a spike there around 7, 7, 10 or something like that. I can't really explain it, but I can explain why it goes down afterwards, because that's when I went for breakfast. So I left the room with the sensors, and there was no one breathing there at that time. Um, then I got back to the room, you see. I'm going to take this one here, show you. This one here is when I got back to the room. And then I went down here. Um, and I put the sensors in a bag. And I opened the bag, and then it slowly started to climb up until this point here. Got it over here. So this one here is the first break. You can actually see that everybody's leaving the room. And um, then it goes back up. And here the lunch starts. So it will slowly begin to climb up again here. 850, I would say, is acceptable. But it shouldn't get much higher, because then we'll begin to get dizzy. Um, but the measurements from yesterday, I'm afraid, leaves no excuse. Um, if you were dizzy in the afternoon or sleepy in the afternoon, it was because you didn't sleep enough the day before, and not because the level of CO2 was too high. Um, here we have the temperature. Again, this is the reading for my room, the first part of it here, I think there. Then you have a huge spike. Um, and the reason for that spike is that I put the sensor into the bag, as I just told you, but I also had the um, uh, power supply of my MacBook that had just unplugged in the same bag. So it was rather hot. Then uh, I took it out, and it, you see it, it's about, well, 22 something. Here, this is just very recent. You have another spike. Um, I was sitting with the sensor over there examining it, and I think I managed to put the, uh, the sensor on top of my computer where the fan is. So that's why you have a spike here. I should have left it alone, but it seems to be swinging in again on, on temperature here. The last reading, you got the same spike. This is the humidity. Um, the top here is probably around the hour. I had a shower this morning, and uh, the room got damp. OK. The sensors. We have here, this is the CO2 sensor, this is the sensor, and this is the device that actually reads the sensor and sends it on to the server, which is in Copenhagen, by the way. Um, they've been lying over there yesterday, and the screen you saw over there was displaying the data. Um, and this one here uh, is a, a temperature sensor and a humidity sensor that's being read on the same device here. Right. Um, just to, to give you a very brief overview of what this is about here, is that on this side here, over here, we have the things, if I may say so. A thing is a sensor that is connected with a microcontroller. And then again, it is somehow connected to the internet. Um, there are various ways that you can connect to the internet. You can use Wi-Fi, which these ones does. 
but you could also use Bluetooth or GSM or even uh, the two I've mentioned up here. LoRa is a sort of a community-driven, long-range uh, radio transmission of, of, of uh, signals, and Sigfox is a commercial, long-range um, uh, data transmission. They also have the advantage, you could say, seen from a security perspective, that they are not sending over the internet. They're sending their own proprietary protocol. So, you somewhat get it on the internet, and then on the other end, you get the data uh, in your data fit program or whatever program where you have some web service that can, can, can um, um, store the data or to process the, the data in some way. Um, that is done uh, via web services that are being pushed from the device. You could also send messages from your server application to the device uh, in order to pull data out. Uh, but there are some security and other aspects uh, of that, so it's not that commonly used. Um, for us, it began about a year ago, uh, a little bit by accident. I had been planning for some time to, to go into IoT just to find out what everybody was talking about. Because everybody was talking IoT, but I'd never actually seen how does an IoT device look like, what can it do? And then it happened that Janine from Data Exits, she gave me this thing here. It's a laser pen. It's the one you have there. Um, it's very nice, but the point is that I'm not doing presentations every day. So I thought, it's, it's, it's too good just to lay there, you know. Uh, could not use it for something else. Um, so I got the idea that I could make a laser tripwire uh, as you have them in the, uh, the films, where the villain is supposed to go into a room and there's a lot of uh, infrared uh, beams, and if he crosses one, then alarm will go off. This is a prototype of a uh, laser tripwire we have here. Um, so when I got that to work, then being a programmer and so on, I immediately thought, the whole world should know the status of this pen here, so I've got to get it on the internet. Um, however, at that point, I faced a dilemma. Um, these devices here, you would normally program in C, uh, which I also did. And I had... Yeah, I wasn't able to find a SOAP client in C, so I would have had to make it myself. Or I needed a REST service, web service in Dataflex. So I was trying to find out which is the lesser evil. The point is, though, that this is not something you would want to do. SOAP is too big, it's too cumbersome, and you don't want to put that on an embedded device with very, very limited resources on it. So REST is much more suited for that. So I uh, tried to find out, could I do something like that in Dataflex? And while trying to find out, I found out that Dataflex actually does REST, in a way anyway, but certainly sufficient enough for my purposes here. Um, so how was that? We have here a Dataflex uh, web service. This is the WSO file, so you can see what messages are displayed and uh, what messages you can call. And I made a hello world, or hello Dolly, as it is, web service. And as you might have seen, you've got this JSON option when you uh, are calling a web service. And if you click that, you get this URL here that will be displayed. And what that is, is a get URL. 
the get verb in the rest uh, web service. Uh, and this is all you need. Let's have a look at it. From the census perspective, we have here a web service call. I am, uh, I've got an object here called client, which is a web client, and it sends out this message here, which you can recognize from the URL you saw before. And we just have to tell it the host, the IP number or of the host, and fire it away. On the Dataflex side, well, you all know that. It's just a message that is public. So when you call the web service with this parameter here, it will answer, well, hello, Dolly. This is all you need to connect an embedded device with a Dataflex web service. Literally, well, three lines of code, very simple. There is absolutely no voodoo involved in this thing here. So, what are we dealing with? Um, first of all, microcontrollers, or MCUs. Um, a microcontroller is something that's been around for about uh, 40 years, I think. Um, they started out, uh, Intel started out in 1978, I think, with a microcontroller. And the idea with a microcontroller was to move certain tasks from the realm of electrical engineering into software engineering. Because this little bugger can do almost anything uh, that is designed for. Um, so normally you would, or well, before that, you would, you, would, you would make a huge uh, uh, PCB with a lot of electronic components and transistors and everything that would do the same that you could then, from then on, program into it. Um, it does a lot of simple, repetitive tasks, but it does it fast. And what it does is that it reads or writes on what is called GPIOs, general purpose IOs. Um, in the recent years, uh, some have built microcontrollers and Wi-Fi uh, chips together. And at that time, the whole IoT thing began to gain momentum. Because now it really gets very easy. Um, if you were to start with it, Here's some examples. This is an Arduino. Arduino is uh, dating back to, I think, 2009, is, and is an in Italian uh, developed platform. You can almost hear that from the name. They call it open source hardware platform. And as it is, everybody uses Arduino today. It's very, very ideal for prototype developing and um, it's now sort of setting a standard. Um, what you have here is some of the, this is the digital GPIOs, and over here you have some analog uh, GPIOs, means that you can feed it with signal that is either zero or one. This can also output, or you can, there are six uh, AD converters so that you can interpret an, an, an analog signal. Then it, it has a um, connection to the uh, serial connection to the, um, to the uh, computer, to a computer via USB. That's this one here. And you can put out an external power supply on this one here. And then you've got what you need. That is, this one does not go on the internet in, as, as it is here. You need some extra equipment with it. Um, you can put a top in it and then it fits down to the hole here and then you can certainly uh, uh, go on the internet. Um, but it's a big, big for that purpose. You can't, you can't make small IoT devices with, uh, with a thing like that. 
you would go over to these ones here. The one to the far right from your site, I think, uh, the ESP8266 is a microcontroller together with a Wi-Fi connection. Um, and it's really size of a stamp. Um, it has to be a surface-mounted solder, so uh, it could be a di bit difficult. But the thing you have here in the middle, the D1 Mini, is the same chip, but it's mounted on what is called a breakout board. It also has um, a, a USB connection, and it has a power regulator, and it's got everything you basically need. It's of this size here. I can just, if you could pass it around, you would see this is the size of the things that we work with in the IFC. Actually, this one is also big, but um, it's small enough for using in, 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 in real devices. Um, so why would you use Arduino? As I said, it is a de facto standard. Everybody else, all the other manufacturers, are sort of following that, the Arduino standard. And um, it's very easy to work with. It really is. Um, and as I said, it's referenced to by all other producers of the microcontrollers. Everybody wants to be Arduino compatible because then they know that people can get working with it. Uh, the complication, uh, the level of complication can even uh, easily rise very much if you really want to, but you can always go back to the reference, to the Arduino reference point and program from there. And the Arduino has an IDE um, which works for most other uh, microcontrollers. Um, this is the IDE and it's there's an editor, and there's a provision for uh, flashing the, M the, 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 uh, the MCU, that putting the software on the MCU. Um, and what you have here is something that looks very typical as uh, uh, how programs for a microcontroller might look. You have a method called setup, where you establish the internet connection and set up whatever parameters uh, you want. Uh, or you need, and then you have this loop method. This one is empty, but what it just do the same and the same and the same again, like these ones here is um, reading a sensor, transmitting the data, going into sleep mode, waking up again, reading the sensors, sending the data, going into, and it does the same and the same and the same. Um, how do you connect it? How do you work with it? This thing here, over here, that one, that is a humidity um, temperature sensor. And on the other side, we have the Arduino. This is like a very, very simple intelligence test. You take the plus uh, pin from the uh, sensor and put it into the plus 5 volts of the Arduino, and you take the minus and put it into the ground, and then you take, in this case here, uh, the data and put it into an arbitrary digital pin here. That is what it takes. This is what this one does. It just that free wires into the um, into the Arduino, and the rest is programming, which we all know how to do. So the electrical engineering part of this is really, really not very, very big, actually. Um, so if you want to make something and uh, you found out that you want to do, um, like, measuring the temperature in your refrigerator, so you get hold of one of these, then where do you find out how to use it? What do you do? Very often, the vendor, the place where you sold it, will actually tell you what to do um, in most cases. But if they don't, Google it. So I tried to Google this sensor here, 
which is called an AM2302 with the Arduino. And the first hit you get out here, it contains tutorial, library, wiring. It's got everything you need to make the thing work. And it's with, like, it's with that with all other uh, uh, things that you get told out there. Uh, Tons of information and tons of libraries out there to use with them. Here are some of the uh, centers. Um, I bought a box full of different sensors just to have something to play with here. Um, gas sensor. Um, we use um, gas for cooking in Copenhagen anyway. If you forgot to switch it on, this one could tell you, hey, you should do something. Uh, color, this is color of life. Light, sorry. Infrared sensor. A hall sensor. This one in particular measures a magnetism, electromagnetism. Um, a vibration sensor, a light sensor. The moisture sensor here is something that you put into your, what's it called in English, pottery, the, the plants you have at home. Uh, and it will... Yeah, it will tell you whether you should water it or not. Um, now, maybe you will say that, that it's easy enough for you to see if it sort of needs water. But at least in Denmark, we have companies that rent out plants, big ones. And they have, a, they have a roster on when to come and water the different plants at the different buildings. Um, this thing here might save you for one trip because it's telling you that this plant doesn't need to, to, to have water this week. So that way you can actually, and there are people who are doing that, are something that's made a, 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 a business like that. Uh, and there are big savings in uh, not having to, 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 to follow a specific roster and you go out there and you find out you should do something, and then the trip is wasted. Um, and there are many, many more laces uh, or, 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 or sensors than, than those ones here. So what are we doing with it? We have this one here, um, which we call Be Aware. I think I have the logo on this one here. You can see the logo. You can see the mouse. What that one does is that it will tell you if a lamp is switched on or off. Now again, you might see, well, I can easily see if the lights in here are switched on and off. But in Denmark, and I think in a lot of other European countries, I don't know if it's that uh, um, focused upon here in the USA, but in Europe, we do very much in energy, energy savings. And there are companies that will um, go in your building, your office building, they will try to analyze it, and then it will come up with a suggestion on how to save energy. That could be re-insulating the walls, that could be changing the windows, that could be changing the heating system. One thing that they almost always suggest is that you change the lighting from the old-fashioned neon lights to modern LED lighting. There's a lot of uh, money to be saved here, but the point is that with a specific business model here, they will even lend you the money to change, to make all these changes. And they will say, we will charge you the savings that you make the next three years. But in order to be able to do that, they have to document how much did you actually save. And you can do that with a heating bill, but you can't do it with the light. Because when you measure the electricity used, it's a mixture of electricity for light, for computers, for toasters, for hoovers, and for everything that uses. It doesn't tell you in the old buildings. Some new buildings does where they've thought about it in the beginning, but in the old buildings, you can't tell what is what. So we put these ones up in the vicinity of a lamp. And normally, I mean, if you have lamps like here, you don't switch everyone on and off individually, so one sensor can probably measure for the whole sort of bunch of lamps here. And when you know what you had before and you have now, you can easily measure out how much did you save because you know for how long the light was on. 
Um, these are real data. It's from a uh, canteen at a hospital. Um, and what we see here, the blue ones down here, the sort of fat blue ones, that's a canteen kitchen. They're open steadily 12 hours every day, except in the weekend, that it's only about eight hours. The light blue ones here, uh, I happen to know, is where they do the dishwashing. Um, and the others are where people actually eat. But the canteen is not for open for people who could come in as for, it's only about eight hours a day, so that won't be so long. And if there's no one there, they won't switch on the light. So that's why these ones here are narrow. It means that um, uh, you, um, they, it wasn't switched on for so long time. Now here you can only see how much electricity was used. If you scrutinize the data, you can see when they start working, when they go home, and whatever happens in, 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 the, um, in, the, in the shop here. Um, so, what is the situation on the IoT business today? We have companies that would love to sell you microcontrollers and sensors. I've just mentioned some of the big ones like Intel, Texas Instruments, Infineon, Silicon Labs, you probably know them all. This one I called AI Thinker. You probably don't know that one, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was the biggest one. It's a Chinese company that are manufacturing the thing they're sent around, and they are selling millions and millions and millions of them. Um, the particular device there is about $4 uh, with a breakout board. If you buy it without a breakout board, it will be $1.5. It's a good price for a computer, I would say. Then, on the other side, with the IoT infrastructure, you've got players like Microsoft, IBM Watson, that's Google, and that's Amazon uh, web services we have here. They would like to sell you what they like to do is that if you can't make your own web services, they will help you with it. Uh, as it is, as I tried to say before, since we have Dataflex, we don't need that. We don't need that layer here. In the middle of all that, we got the one who makes the solutions. That's us, you. And I'm saying here, void. There are very few at the moment who are actually doing this. And um, it's very obvious when you go into this business here. It's like being, there's nothing organized. There's nothing, there's not, nothing like we used to do this or we normally do that. This is the Wild West. It's like somebody just cried gold in California and we all jumped up on the prairie wagon trying to get out there first, as it is. Um, you can also feel that when you talk to either those guys over there or the other ones, that you are being very, very nicely treated because they all love them, you to use their service or their device. Um, yes. I have added some useful links here that uh, you can go and have a look at um, to see what more it's about. And you've got here um, some vendors of uh, uh, sensors and you could be inspired of, of, of uh, looking into those web services here. And that's what I have to say today. Thank you.